motion to approve the agenda. I move. I second. Uh, okay, roll call. Commissioner Newton? Here. Present. Mr. Rockford. Approved. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Work with me. Commissioner Patrick? Yes. Commissioner Burns? You bet. Commissioner Bennett? Yes. Commissioner Kirk? Yes. Commissioner Knox? Yes. Yes. Uh, do I have a motion to, well, not a motion yet. Are there any amendments to the to the minutes from the last meeting? Not an amendment, but I have a comment. One. That um, page four, the top of page four, first two paragraphs are just really makes me sad. Lisa, I didn't hear all of that. I said the top of page four of the minutes, rereading it, made me sad. But you don't want to change anything? No. Okay. Well, well, yeah, nothing that I can change. Yeah, okay. Okay, then do I have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. <clears throat> Second. Roll call. Commissioner Patrick? Yes. Commissioner Burke? I'm staying. Commissioner Bennett? Yes. Commissioner Kirk? Yeah. Commissioner Knox? Yes. Commissioner Newton? Yes. Chair Johnson? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is a quasi-judicial uh, hearing regarding the public hearing and consideration of SR 19-02, request by David Veneta for a setback reduction to allow the replacement of the existing single family residence. Uh, the applicant, David Venado of Tolavana Architect, on behalf of the property owner, is requesting a setback reduction to reduce the side yard setback from 5 feet to 3 feet, the rear <clears throat> yard setback from 15 feet to 9 feet, where the oceanfront management overlay section 17.42050 general standards is in effect <clears throat> and for a parking variance to reduce the required parking from two spaces to one space in conjunction with the replacement of the existing dwelling. Uh, the location, the property is located at 235 West Sayulo Street, tax lot 2100, uh, map 51031DD, and in a residential moderate uh, density zone. <clears throat> the property is owned by uh, Michael and Marianne Orth, Municipal Code Section 17.12.040 standards is requires a minimum five foot side yard setback and a 15 foot front and uh, uh, 15 foot front and rear yard setback. The request will be reviewed against the Municipal Code Section 17.64.01. Oh, setback reduction. Does anyone object to the jurisdiction of the design review board? To, I mean, <coughs> any commission to hear this matter at this time? Does any member believe that she or he has a conflict of interest or personal bias? <coughs> has any member had uh, ex parte contact or made a site visit? Site visit. Oh, site visit. They're having trouble hearing. Does anybody yeah. have any trouble hearing me? Yeah. Yes. We, we have hearing losses, and every time we have multiple mics, we can't hear it. I've been speaking to the mic, but can't. Yeah, we need. Yeah, you may need to pull it towards you a little bit there. Yeah. It, it is kind of uh, sensitive. Is that better? I don't think so. Thank you. Can you hear everybody else? But don't point me out then. <laughs> test, test, test. Um, yeah. Okay. If 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 you guys uh, throughout the evening, if you have, if you're starting to have trouble here, and just do this, and I'll, we'll, I'll keep an eye out and see if it we can. Okay. Is there a staff report? Uh, yes. So uh, I'll I'll just start with the uh, kind of go over the highlights of it. Uh, 
property's dimensional restrictions of 2,500 square feet and limited access contribute to the parking variance that was granted earlier this year uh, for the 9 by 18 slot. Uh, and I want to point out something uh, from that and clarify, uh, it was in the notice and this, is that uh, when the variance was granted earlier this year, both in the motion and the minutes, there was no mention of the approval of the front yard setback reduction, uh, although the minutes clearly state that there was no opposition to granting that as, it, because it was, a, it was noticed as a parking variance, and yet we didn't uh, calculate that in. And so I wanted to put that into the notice and clarify that this is so that we just get it on the record uh, and so uh, if anyone has any questions on that or comments uh, so what has happened the parking variance earlier this year was granted so what it did was instead of providing two spaces they're, they're only having to provide one on on site so that's for a 9 by 18 space well that 9 by 18 space you know also a front yard setback needs to be 15 and not 10 or that nine right and so we didn't ask for that difference between that and the setback reduction and and it just kind of went as assumed because the parking variance was granted i want to clarify that we didn't have any opposition from anyone neighbors or anyone on that front yard setback that i can recall or that i've looked at in the minutes and so I just want to clarify that if you guys are going to approve this tonight or at least uh, hear it, that that be included in that, okay? Hey, I was at that meeting, and there, we did not grant a right. backyard setback. In fact, there was not even any inkling that we would. Ex that's exactly. That's what I'm trying to clarify, okay? It wasn't as part of that because... The, you granted a parking variance from two down to one, right. okay? But where are you going to park that one car is the question, okay? You've got to have room for it uh, according to our code, and that has to be approved through a setback reduction of that, that space, so that difference. Or a redesign of the whole house no well yeah I mean, there's no. other ways to do it we never well, even sure. considered sure okay yes just, okay. just to be clear a parking spot would require the same conditions as a setback are you saying that the, because you approved just one parking spot that the the conditions for a setback had also been met is that I can I what I what I'm saying is in that front yard okay which is where that parking space uh, uh, is is would be is located on their plans so if we want to look at this graphic see this area right here where the parking space is located 9 by 18 that by our code is the front yard and it needs to be 15 feet according to our code right and so right here and so they asked for a variance and you know it's it's my fault I should have caught that and so that should be uh, a, also a setback reduction asked for that space as well and that's what I want to clarify in this okay because you granted the variance does that make sense so I think what so I think what Jeff is saying is that you have approved a variance, but you have not identified the location of it yet. And this setback is required in order to accommodate the location of that one space that you have approved. I, I wasn't here for this for this vote. Yeah. But I can see why it's confusing. If 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 the commission thought that they were granting one parking spot and they were also granting a, a setback, that, that could open a door to a larger question. Yeah. I can see why there would be concern making the jump from one parking spot to now to set back. Yeah, and so... Because they needed two, two legally, they had to have right, but if two you, parking spaces, and to accommodate them, we agreed to one. Right. So they could figure out a way to do it. That was how it worked. It wasn't... There was no mention of a setback reduction. There was no mention of any of that or coming back. Before the well, there, there was a mention of it. I mean, it was drawn on the plan of where they were placing that. But I think, I think putting a parking spot in that, in that plan is much different than going, now you have that setback, which in the future could be who knows what. 
that, as we know, runs with the property. So right. that, that would be, um, again, I, I, didn't, I didn't sit through that testimony, but um, from the outside, that would be my concern. Basically, when we dealt with this the first time, We granted the, the reduction in the parking spaces required, uh, assuming that they would accommodate that reduction within the standard rules of setbacks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we basically we're giving them the freedom to, to put it that one spot wherever they wanted it. Uh. You know, I, I don't, I, there was a, you, you saw plans, and so that was well, a. Plan, you see, you know, yeah, we saw plans, and we had a discussion about, you know, the idea of uh, uh, reducing the, the parking by one parking spot, but there was no connection between that and setback reduction. We didn't. Didn't a reduction in the number of required parking spots, which is an entirely different okay. issue. So, are we walking into a conflict here, where we have this body has approved something in the past, and now we're being asked to no. approve it again? Are we staying away from something like that? No. Okay. Yeah. Sure. That's why I want to clarify that. So. Okay. So. Uh, the subject product is 25 by 100 with an ocean uh, front setback reduction estimated at 28 feet by 6 inches. The current dwelling was placed on the lot in 1938. Total building coverage proposed is for 28% of the lot. Uh, the house is re redesigned for a 17 foot wide house footprint for what the applicant states is the minimum required width for minimal usable stair, hallway, bedroom, and kitchen widths. Um, in 1764-10A2, uh, the applicant states that based on calculations from the site plan, the neighbor's view to the northwest will be, re be reduced by one degree or 8.5 inches with this setback reduction request. Um, what must be kept in mind under this consideration is not the comparisons be based on the existing structure, but rather what is the potential building envelope, as the applicant points out with regards to views. There may be a significant difference in what is proposed and what exists, but what should be considered is between what is proposed and what the potential might be. I don't and, understand that. Okay, so I have gave you on uh, the, at the back of the staff report, You'll see a sheet that has a blue and green uh, uh, envelope. And so what I'm trying to point out is, and is in, with the red, uh, that's the difference of the proposed to a potential building envelope footprint. In other words, that's the volume right there uh, that's increasing in the building envelope. Okay? Does the that... The volume that's increasing. Yeah. You know, that's what they're asking for. The, that's what the setback reduction, that is what they're asking for in volume. Mm -hmm. And it's not from the existing, this is from the proposed to the potential building envelope. And what does so, that mean? What is potential building envelope? So, that what, they're, what they're allowed to do within the current setbacks of the uh, envelope, the building envelope? Yeah. Okay. Is, is much different than what a single story home that sits there now. And so as, as when you're looking at the setback reduction, you're asking, well, they can legally build to that line. In other words, where that white line is, that's where they can legally build to without, any, without coming before you guys. That's, that's the legal building envelope. Okay. Okay, so I'm just showing you the difference between what they're asking for, going, you know, beyond that. And what is the green? And so the green is what, where that building actually sits now, okay? Mm -hmm. And so 
That's what's being reduced by this plan. Okay. But isn't there a second story going on? Yeah. Yeah, but that is, that's, that's what I'm trying to point out, that they can go a second story on this lot legally. And to, right? Yes. And so I'm, ask, I'm just pointing that out. And, and actually, l legally, they can go where this, uh, David uh, will explain the one degree difference there on this little chart that I, I used to do this. But honestly, uh, if they go to what's legal, where that white line continues or that interior line of the building envelope, that can continue on out to that projection of that oceanfront setback line as well. So I would, I would even argue that legally they can build to that, that point. And so does that, do you understand what I'm trying to say there? And so, so would they cut, and, what, and what percentage of the lot would they cover then if they built out to that? What they could they, they could do it to the same. I'm not suggest, suggesting that the lot coverage has to change. That they can move that, regardless. I'm just showing you where that cube could be. Okay, the building envelope, and they can take up that total percentage of the lot coverage wherever they want within that lot. Is what I'm asking. Mm -hmm. So, this is just your guide to how what the difference and what they're asking for. Does that make sense? I see Joe shaking his head no. So the potential drawing here with the red and the, and the green, that is showing a four-foot setback on both the south and the north side of the, of the yeah. potential. Yeah. And so uh, it's asking for that one foot is what that's being asked for there. But, but the, the potential, isn't it supposed to be what's legal? That, right, that's so what it is. So it wouldn't be a four-foot setback. No, it's, it's going, that is from the four to the five. That's one foot. And yeah. right now, it's, at three. what is the, the side setback? It's like three and a half feet. It's at three, at three and a half. Yeah. So in one way, if they're rebuilding and tearing down and rebuilding, you know, normally they would have five foot on either side. Right. And maybe they could extend it back further back. But, uh, I mean, just because they have the, the three and a half foot now doesn't mean. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to clarify that point that they're, you know, in other words, we're not determining whether they can, you know, increase it to a second story. It's just, you know, what they're asking for in this reduction. Okay. Okay. So that line, the oceanfront setback line, the dotted line at the um, <coughs> right. What is, so what do you mean they could extend it all the way? Okay, so if you see the interior portion of the red, right? Uh -huh. That stops at about uh, a foot shy of that dotted line. That could honestly extend. They, oh, you mean they could extend it one foot out yeah, on yeah. The one side because the other side's already... On, right, exactly. On, they can't extend that side. Right, so no. they could extend <clears throat> that little tiny wedge. Yeah, which is to... yeah, which is about what we're talking about in the difference here of that angle. That's what I'm oh. saying. You know, it could conceivably extend as well. Jeff, when I was looking over the city council minutes, and there was discussion of new evidence. Yes, he'll he'll bring in some. I think he's going to talk to this okay. here. So. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts on that? So there was no additional correspondence other than what's in the packet, right? Just the uh, Fitzpatrick's boss and... Yeah, Postal. Postal White. Well, there was someone who took back what they said originally. She'll, I'm sure she's here tonight. She's she's tonight. Yeah. So there was two or three against it, correct? I have two against and one for. Right. Um, okay. yeah. And the, uh, one thing I didn't notice on the four was where that person, where they live. Postal weight. Uh, uh -huh. Let me see.
Uh, she doesn't identify. I can, I can search. Yeah, we can search. Wait. What, do you do you know where they live? Uh, we can we can find we'll, out. We'll get we'll get to that. Okay. okay. Uh, the pertinent criteria to be considered are noted in the staff report and listed on the criteria sheet next to the west door. Testimony, argument, and evidence must be directed towards that criteria or other criteria in the comprehensive plan or municipal code, which the person testify, testifying believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by a statement or evidence sufficient to, to afford the decision makers and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes the appeal based on the issue. Prior to the conclusion of the initial evidentiary hearing, any participant may request an opportunity to present additional testimony, argument, and evidence regarding the application. The Planning Commission shall grant such a request by continuing the public hearing and leaving the record open for additional written testimony, argument, and evidence. Um, persons who are testifying shall be recognized by the chair, state your full name and mailing address, and if you are in a representative capacity, identify who you represent. Is there a presentation by the applicant? That's actually the butcher family cabin, uh, and so uh, the lady's name was actually her married name, and butcher is the family, so that would, butcher would be her. Family. So that's 3543? Uh, that's correct. Sorry. That's this lot on the other side of Fitzpatrick's. The reason I know that is that I can their, their remodel for them, and that was, uh, in fact, something I wanted to cite. Uh, and that is, they were granted uh, a reduction, a side guard setback reduction from five feet to four feet, identically to what we're asking for to see. So we feel there's a precedent there, and uh, they were granted that setback reduction for the very same reasons we're asking for a reduction uh, for the horse this evening. And that is, with a 25 foot lot, it's really limited to what you do architecture on the interior of the house. And uh, again, uh, based on the uh, desire to just have a straight stair, hallway, and bedroom. 
error ratio is actually 54%, so we're below the, uh, the maximum of 60%. So we're both, we're both uh, below uh, floor area ratio as well as lot coverage on the proposal. Um, to touch on the parking briefly, I hadn't really talked to uh, Jeffrey about uh, the technicalities of the reduction. We are showing the rear of the house nine foot seven off the property corner, the southeast property corner, and we would like to include that in the setback reduction this evening. Um, I wasn't aware that technically it was not included. I, I was under the impression that it was. Uh, however, I think that's something we'd be uh, interested in clearing up as well this evening. Um, what I'd like to do, I'll get back to the actual view angles that uh, Jeffrey had mentioned. Uh, from the Fitzpatrick's, but uh, what I was hoping to do was, and hopefully this will kind of clarify for you, uh, what we can do with the site with and without a variance. So if you look at TA 1.1, I've actually included a site plan that shows the footprint of the house with the variance, and that is a simple rectangle with four foot side guard setbacks on the north and south side. Without a variance, it's interesting that you can actually get closer to the side yards with the allowed projections that are in the code. So those allowed projections uh, actually can be 10 feet long and 1 foot 6 wide, or come out from the house 1 foot 6. So by code, and without a variance, we can actually come within 3 and a half feet of the side property. Instead of four, which is what we're asking for. You mean eaves? You're talking about eaves? No, I'm not talking about eaves. I'm talking about the footprint. I'm talking about the walls of the house, the foundation, and the walls, and the actual structure of the house, irregardless of eaves. Bay window. Eaves are actually allowed to project 18 inches into setbacks, or beyond. So what would that be? That'd be the house. The house can actually go within three and a half feet of the property line without a variance. But not the foundation. Bay window, as Bay long window. as it's not, uh, if I remember that section of the code, uh, it's as long it's as it's, yeah, as long as it's a projection. Right, like a bay window or yeah. a fireplace or something of that nature. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you can't walk in there. Yeah. So, yeah. so you're saying, and the one on the right, you're not going to have any eaves. That's correct. We're not, with the four-foot setback, we're not proposing to come back later and say, Jeffrey, oh, by the way, we want to take advantage of that 18-inch rule and all of a sudden add projections here. We are, that's not what we're trying to do here. So what, what we are trying to do is just ask for a one-foot reduction for a total 17-foot finished width for the house. Now, there will be an eave. And uh, I have indicated a 12-inch eave at this point. We would have been allowed an 18-inch eave by code. I've actually reduced that to 12 inches. So uh, face of gutter, if you will, or face of eave, will be 3 feet. But the face of the building, the wall, would be 4 feet. Now, keep in mind, the existing house is actually 2.6 feet off the property. So we're actually improving the existing condition. Well, except this existing house is a single-story house. Yeah. And what you're proposing is a two-story house. So that's yeah, but huge. I mean, that's a huge difference. You have to admit. There's no difference it, in, this, in the code. I'm not talking about the code. I'm talking well, about as far as, you know, a neighbor would be concerned. There's sure. a huge difference yeah. between a two-story house closer to you than a one-story house. Yeah. But we're here for the code. Well, I know that. It's all based on the vote that's what we use. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here. So. And it's five feet. Yeah. And it's allowed. We're allowed to go two story. So oh, I know. I know you yeah. are. But the code, if, if it's all based on the code, then the code's five feet. Mm -hmm. The existing house is 2.6 feet. That's all I'm saying. Right. Yeah. One story, 2.6 feet. Mm -hmm. So we're actually improving the setbacks to four feet. Reducing the skyline. We're 
consuming more volume for the house. That's correct. So this, David, um, yeah. you're, so it's, it would be, help me with this, it would be a 15 foot wide house without the setback versus, you can see, uh, yes, seven. without the setback, it would be a 15 foot wide house. Uh, with the setback reduction, it would be a 17 foot house, 17 foot wide house. And what do you gain in that house with that additional two feet? Basically, we're able to line up a stairway, a hallway, and bedrooms. If we weren't able to do that, we had to go to a 15 foot plan, we'd have to turn that stairway because there's just physically not room in a 15 foot wide floor plan to do all three parallel with each other. So what would happen is the stairway would turn and become a U-shaped stair and consume a lot more valuable floor space out of the house. Because all of a sudden the stair is twice as wide and 15 feet wide, 15 feet long. So the 17 foot version of this plan, and believe me, I've studied the 15 foot and 17 foot tall. And the 17 foot is just so much more efficient. Okay, What's you. the total square footage of the entire house? <clears throat> uh, 760 plus 780, so 14, just over 1,500 square feet. Does that include decks? Uh, no, that doesn't include the deck, which is probably. Probably 90 square feet a day. Yeah. So by no means is it a big house. It's uh, it's certainly as efficient as we can certainly make it within that 17 foot by by 46 foot by. So the deck is the deck is actually over this bunk room down below. Yeah, no, so it's going to be a waterproof deck. But what I'm trying to figure out is if the deck intrudes onto the ocean front. Oh, absolutely not. No. Yeah, if you look at the floor plan for the 17 foot upper floor, uh, here is on the west end of the plan is the uh, ocean front setback, which coincides with this angle on the main floor plan as well. So, no. Uh, there's no, we wouldn't be allowed to project beyond the ocean front setback. Okay. Um, so, I have a question, David. Sure. What's the, what's the square footage of the current structure there? kind of house that you would put on a 25 foot wide <laughs> piece of property. Uh, yeah, although, you know, it was built before any kind of ocean front setback rules, I think, like that. So they certainly could have made it a lot better. But uh, that shows not to for, for whatever reason. Um, let me turn back to the uh, view issue. Um, and uh, the dispatchers indicated that they were concerned about the view from their bedroom window. Uh, what I did was actually um, check out on Google Earth the actual view corridors, uh, not only the haystack rocks, but also uh, the view angle to the corner of the house. Uh, I didn't see the colored version of what Jeffrey put together, but the difference going from the 15 foot to the 17 foot width created a, a difference of eight and a half inches in the view angle from their bedroom. And that translates
translates, if you see these two lines, these two lines represent the view past the corner of the house 15 feet wide and the view past the corner of the house 17 feet wide. So that angle, the difference in that angle of those two lines is one degree. So we did not feel that that was a major impact. Now uh, Fitzpatrick's will be testifying like you mentioned and they, they may argue otherwise, but at this point, the difference between the 15 and the 17 foot width creates one degree of impact to the earth. So. So, David, what's the new evidence? I'm confused about what the new evidence is, the reason you can't, because we denied this before, and then the you, it was remanded back to us by the um, right. council because of new evidence. So I'm, I'm yeah, the new evidence is a 17 foot width. We did not appeal to the city council the 19 foot width or your decision of denial on the 19 foot. What we were hoping to do and hoping to present to the city council as new evidence was the 17 foot width. So before you were asking for even the bigger. Yes, remember we were asking for a 19 foot width yeah. and a reduction from five feet to three feet. So. We took a hard, long look at it, and frankly, that's what's taken so long to get back to you folks. Um, we've been working hard to try to figure out how to make this work. We've been working hard with the neighbors, um, trying to, you know, get buy-in, of course, uh, because that's always easier when we come to you and say, you know, the neighbors are for this. And uh, so that's what we try to do. It takes time to get together and, and uh, reach consensus, and I think uh, Michael and Marianne done a good job uh, discussing it, and uh, I think the, I think most of the, all the neighbors, would take for, perhaps the uh, exception of Fitzpatrick, are, are buying in on the, on the concept. So uh, we also feel good, like to say that uh, the butchers um, were granted this, the same variance that we're asking for this evening. And, but you uh, don't know the conditions that were that gave them that. You, you don't know why they were granted. I did the house. I okay. got the variance. I was there. But there was a whole difference. It was a whole different. It was a five foot lot. So, I, rem they, I they remember it. I was so. there. Good one. What, what year was that? Um, This says 2016, I thought. Just out of curiosity, this may mean nothing. Where, where does the butchers park their car? I'm sorry, where? where where's the parking on the lot that was approved before? I'm sorry, this lot? Yeah. Uh, they park right in this front lot area. They have, this is their lot. I see. So they've got a big grassy front yard. I see. Yeah. Thank you. And I don't even know that they have an improved driveway. And how wide is this Bloss house that's up uh, the house to the north of? Um, it is, um, it, it meets the five foot setbacks, but it has, it took advantage of those projections that I referred to. Of the bump out. Of the 18 inches. You can see them here right. on the south side. Now, whether they fully comply, I can tell you I wasn't the architect on that one. But, but, uh, but yeah, that, that does mean except for the single parking. They were granted a single parking space and a, uh, no doubt, a reduction in their front yard setback to the alley. Okay, any other questions for David? And you would include the parking spot just like it's shown here on the map? Uh, that's correct. We actually indicated this is a nine foot seven and again, we're hoping to have that ratified this evening so that represents a reduction from 15 feet to roughly 9 foot 7 in the front yard setback. Okay. Can I, can I clarify a couple points there? Uh, that setback reduction, I have it as the butcher house was uh, in fort, uh, 2014, uh, uh, 
setback reduction 1403. And then I want to also clarify that projections into the required yards. That's 17970. Uh, and A says cornices, eaves, window sills, and similar incidental architectural features may project not more than 18 inches into a yard required to a minimum of 5 feet or 36 into a yard required to be 15 or more. Uh, B, and that's what we're talking about here, bay windows with no usable floor area and not exceeding a length of 10 feet and not more than one per building elevation may project not more than 18 inches into a required yard uh, or 36 inches into the required front or rear. Uh, bay windows may not project into a required ocean yard. And then C, chimneys shall not project not more than 24 inches into a required yard. So chimneys can actually go even further. So then the, the, uh, a bay window, is there any height limit to how that projection can go? No. Okay. And the same thing with the chimney? Yeah, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any presentations by proponents? So good evening. My name is Michael Orth. 23795 Southwest Trooper Road, Sherwood, Oregon, 97140. Well, I was here at the last meeting. You probably saw me. Thank you for coming back. So I just kind of wanted to, to reemphasize from my perspective sort of why we feel this is a, an extremely reasonable request and just to kind of reiterate what those, what those are. So currently, just to make sure you're, you're understanding it, is because it, it is very confusing, is our house, because it sits perpendicular to the ocean, to the dune, but the property lines are askew a little bit, they're kind of cattywampus. So the house does not sit squarely, sides of the house are not perpendicular currently to the property line. So the, so the northeast corner of my house and the southwest corner of my house are two and a half feet currently from the property line, <coughs> just so you know. So and as David, David said, so, we're, so we want to try and get the house perpendicular or more in line with the existing uh, property lines. So we would be moving that two and a half foot point out to four feet. I just want to make sure that that's understood because I, th I think it kind of gets lost in the, in the translation somewhere. Um, and then also um, a precedent has been set. David talked about it and, and uh, you were asking the question. The butchers, we've talked to the butchers uh, after they built their house and they had the exact same scenario that we do. Their house had been in their family for three generations. It was a single story little cabin probably the same same year that ours was put on, or close to it, 1938. And it's gone through several generations, so the siblings that own it today, they wanted to knock it down, obviously built a larger home, nicer home, newer home. And so the exact same scenario that we're going through is what they went through. And so they got uh, approval all around them for a one foot uh, or four foot variance and the house to their north, directly to their north, was the Fitzpatrick's house, and, and the Fitzpatrick's granted them the one-foot variance. They agreed to that. So uh, again, a, a, a precedent has been set. Um, What's the precedent? The precedent? Yes. A four-foot variance instead of going with the five-foot. Right? One-foot setback versus... Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out which precedent we're talking about. That one. The one that they, they were the one that they received. Okay. okay? And um, I just wanted to um, uh, just kind of reemphasize that. Um, I think David David spoke to you know, and the Fitzpatrick's are friends of ours, so this is very difficult. Um, their feelings are hurt. They felt like we were trying to sneak something by them when our original request came through because they were traveling at that time. Um, and we tried to make amends for that and, and it didn't happen. Um, but they feel very strongly that, um, uh, that their view is gonna be impacted from their bedroom upstairs. 
Yes, it will be because we're going to go from a one-story home to a two-story home. So that view will be impacted. But the one foot, the four foot or five foot, that difference of one feet, uh, as David said, it's going to only impact that view one, one degree. We feel, you know, our opinion is that's very negligible. And uh, what we're asking for is not unreasonable. Um, they also mentioned uh, in their previous testimony that uh, the price their home is for sale, that the uh, sale price of their home or the value of their home is going to be impacted by $14,500 approximately. Uh, I've talked to a couple real estate, two real estate brokers asking them about this because uh, I was a little bit uh, surprised and confused by that comment. And uh, the two real estate brokers I talked to that uh, I explained the scenario both said that because the view is so negligible, the impact of the view uh, is so negligible that there really is, they don't see how anybody could, could assign a dollar value to it, um, and especially that dollar value. Um, so in closing, I just want to reiterate that we feel we've taken our neighbor's concerns uh, into consideration and that our one foot 12 inch request is extremely, uh, very reasonable. Uh, and at the end of the day, will not impact our neighbors any more than if our home was five feet from the property line. So thank you very much for your time. Are there any other proponents that would like to speak? Okay. Are there any opponents? So first of all, I want to straighten out. First of all, we need your name. We need your name and mailing address. Patrick, my mailing address is nine three five zero Southwest one seventy fifth Avenue, Beaverton, Oregon nine seven zero seven. I live right next door at thirty five thirty South Pacific to the Worst House. Um, a few things that have come up here that I want to address before I go into reading this, so I don't get off track, is one of the things you guys are talking about: the parking. Usually when there's a 15-foot front yard setback, that's where your parking is. So they already have their spot for their parking in their 15-foot front yard setback. Um, also, when you were talking about the legally, they can legally go out front. They can't legally go sideways unless they get the variance. Is that correct? When you keep saying they could legally build on this building parcel, they could legally build out to the ocean line. Right. They have to get a variance to go out to the side. Right. Well, they can go to five feet. Okay. So I was describing the building envelope. Um, and they need, things, also, they need a variance in the front yard, too. Pardon me? They need a variance in the front yard, too. Yes. They're asking for a variance in the front yard, too. Um, so another thing that I have kind of pointed out, and my husband will touch on this more later, is they're showing this site distance block, and they're showing it at an angle. But if you look at their plan, they're building the deck out to the line. So it's a little, I was my own John with my house. I know how to read plans. So the top layer, they're going to butt that out a little bit so you can see that on their house design. Okay. Now, because I tend to get sidetracked, I'm going to read this. And I have extra copies because I noticed that in the last minutes that went in the newspaper, didn't quite come out what I said. So I only have eight copies of this, if you guys would like to pass them around. Um, first of all, my husband and I own the house next door to the work property. And this is response to some of the points that were in the packet that we received after we submitted our initial response letter. First of all, I want to say that we should not be here today. Because some personal health and other issues and stress of this, I inadvertently opened new evidence with my rambling at the appeal meeting with the city council, which they were going to deny the setback reductions. Secondly, the city of Cannon Beach has set up building codes and regulations to maintain the livability and quaint style of this town, which I expect the city to uphold. This is one of the biggest draws of why we bought in Cannon Beach. When we bought our place, we had great views in all directions. We knew what the building codes were and knew that someday we would lose some of those views when the neighboring old cottages would be replaced. We should not be losing more of our view by this new building code, which, which should be built or protected by the building codes. Maybe the Orison, the architects say that losing 8.5 inches is insignificant, but it's very significant to us. 
Um, the calculation is from a random spot on our home, not from the end of our building parcel. We can always build our house or add on. So we sit in the middle of this big lot. We have lots of room to add on. Where is the calculation for the boss or other lots for their site distance? This is not just about us or the boss losing some of their site distance of the views. Where is the mention of the Kenny property directly behind? And we'll that will have significant solar impact and lose one foot of view around each side of that house and um, sunlight coming in. Then there is the Kelly residence that they may eventually tear down theirs and build up. They will have this big blockage. And then there's the Davidsons in the house that's over at 3531 South Pacific that has a view between the Orth House and Arms from across the street. They all will be impacted. This is not just us. I know that we were that we were all made of pool up when we agreed to the butcher side yard variance. When they claimed they were going to use the old house because it was going to save them money. They jacked up the house, they built the new foundation, and then once the old house was set in place, they tore down most of the home, all the walls, most of the, found, the, the base of the original floor, floor climbing. I think there was probably about eight to ten boards left from what they jacked up. It was an expensive way, but an effective way to get their four-foot setbacks. And yes, I did agree to it, and I've regretted it ever since. We recently traveled to some areas that had waterfront property so oversized that anyone that did not have waterfront property were just looking at tall buildings and little space between the buildings. It was a very undesirable area. <coughs> Once again, there are building codes for a reason, that is to protect all homeowners and the livability and the attraction of Canada. The requests for these setback reductions are to build a home that is too large for the site. The proposed plan provided by the architect show that they plan to build a four bedroom, two and a half home, two and a half bath home that will sleep 12 with inadequate living space for 12 people. 12 people cannot show up in one car. So this means that there will be an impact on the street parking and more easement parking which blocks the other homeowners from getting to their property. On the City of Cannon Beach Memorandum, that's at the back, I stapled it on the back, that was dated November 21st. It states that the parking variance was approved with the condition that side yard setback reductions be denied. So, this might make the one park space parking variance a legal issue. This house does not have any planned space for outside storage or beach toys or furniture. The ORS currently have a plastic short a storage shed that's the size of cottage, which is slightly on our property, on one corner, and cannot be opened without being on our property. Five foot setbacks would allow for that to be fully functional on their property. The design of the home has only one access door on the lower level. The five foot side yard easements will be used to access the ocean and to put anything in their yard. The area, this area of Tomovano Beach is very unique and has very small, narrow lots with older cottages. As these get replaced, there will be many requests for variances, which are going to make all of these homes too close. Approving less than five foot setbacks will set a precedent that will be hard to fight. When the Bloss House was proposed, the Ors, ourselves, and other neighbors sat in this room to fight a side yard variance. Now that the Ors want to build a new home, with a lot more living space, it's a different story for him. At the expense of all the rest of us neighbors. Other homes in the area, including the developer of the Gloss home, which was about the same time as the Butcher home, were able to design a home within the 15-foot wide building parcel. The home at 213 Sayuswa, which was also built within the 15-foot wide building parcel, was sold within five days recently. And that's this house. I have the flyer that is built on a 25 foot lot and that's 15 feet wide. So it can be done. The ORS knew what the building setbacks were when they recently bought the property from the family trust. So this is not a hardship. They bought it only. One of our biggest concerns and not was noted by the city council members that is that there's a provision for 18 inch overhangs into the setback. These are the roof overhang, a fire box. That's the way I understand it, the fire enclosure for the back fireplace can be 18 inches, but if it's a fireplace, it can be 24. Is that a brick one? But that can be, and one 10 foot long bay or window seat per elevation. That doesn't mean all the way to the ground, all the way to the top. So if they have a bay window, it's only going to come out in one. <coughs> 
cost in the five foot down below. Um, if a setback variance was approved for four feet, then they could still build into that setback by adjusting their design after you guys approve the variance. So if you approve a four foot setback, unless you add conditions to this, they can add that. And I'm kind of concerned about this house design that has the fireplace. So once they get this four foot setback variance, then they throw back, oh, we're going to put our fireplace out into the thing. Now we've lost more of our view. Okay, because then that would be 18 inches out on top of the 12. Now we know the 18 inches legal, can't stop it. We know that they're going to build out in front of the ocean front, can't stop it. We knew that when we bought it. Um, even if conditions were attached to any variance approval, these would very, be very hard to be kept track of in the future. The city planner position has changed over quite a bit lately, and it's very hard to keep track of these. And so the best way to make the job easier on staff is to follow the building code. I know that the fire department said that it is not a problem to have homes this close. But the big fire that recently happened in Wilsonville has been determined to have gotten so out of control due to the close proximity of homes. And that was even with a huge paid resource of firefighters and equipment. So in summary, the developer of the bus home received an east side setback reduction, but not side yard setback reductions, which set a precedent for these three small lots off of this easement. We are okay with the east side nine foot setback variance request, as it does not affect any views of the neighbors, but it might affect the solar impact of the Kenny property. We do not agree to less than five foot setbacks and think no home should be closer than five feet to the property line. And um, once again on the back, I attached that memorandum. So you guys might need to, I'm not a lawyer, <coughs> so I'm not parking experience, but um, another thing that I want to point out, they kept saying the losses agreed to four foot. They have withdrawn that and changed it if you look in your pack. So they do not agree. And they, they actually pulled back the nine foot too. But, um, anyhow, that's my input. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other opponents? Kelly Fitzpatrick, 93.50, Southwest 175 Avenue, Beaver, Tomorrow. I want to remind you, we've heard a lengthy, uh, presentation by, I assume, your wife. So if you have duplicate information. Duplicate oh, okay. I have just a uh, drawing showing the impact on the um, site reduction, the distance reduction. Okay. So I'd like to pass that around. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to speak to only one point, and that was the, um, the um, calculation that uh, David Granada did about the um, showing an eight and a half inch site uh, distance reduction at, on the beachfront. That, that is true for one point on our house as it stands today. What I drew on this uh, diagram, uh, has that gone on yet? The impact on the ocean view is very dependent on where you pick that point. If you look at the point on the corner of the glass house, the red lines, you can see what the impact is for five foot setback versus four foot setback. And it has an approximate view uh, reduction of about 25 feet for one lot. <coughs> so there, you pick a different spot, you get a lot different answer. Same thing applies to our house. If, if we were to fully utilize our lot, and this is something we considered before we remodeled the way we did, if we would have made a, for instance, a, uh, a much wider house that took more advantage of the beachfront, and maybe a, a future um, occupant would do something like this, and we put our corner up to five feet from the lot line, then the impact of them being at four versus five is much greater than the eight and a half inches. It'd be on the order of a 20 foot uh, reduction in the view. So I just wanted, all I wanted to do was address the eight and a half inch uh, view in that. It's, it's as great as 25, 20 to 25 feet. That's the only point. Any questions? 
Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, any other opponents? Okay, uh, is there a staff response? Uh, no, no, just that the uh, memo that she was stating is why we want to clarify tonight. You know, well, that's why it was brought up. Because it does approve, we did, a, you did approve the variance earlier. Now we're clarifying on the setback reduction, the front yard. Okay, then we will close the public hearing and move on to consideration. Is he supposed to? Is there, isn't there a, a, a opportunity for rebuttal from the mm -hmm. we proposed? Well, I'm not reading that here. But is there anybody else that would like yeah, to? Yeah, they should. <laughs> yes, the applicant should have an opportunity yeah, yeah, to yeah. rebut. So before we close the record, let's reopen right. the record and give the applicant an opportunity to rebut the testimony that was submitted in opposition. We said that one. We said that statement one more time. Okay, if we were to pull the house back to the east, away from the ocean front setback by one foot, we would eliminate that eight and three quarter inch or one degree impact to their view from the master bedroom. That would uh, impact your your front. That's correct. We It'd be eight and a half feet instead of nine and a half. You're saying you would you would make the house the same depth? Dimension. The house would be the same dimension, so you're going to shorten the so 
So you're going to be in the front setback even more? Um, or you're going to make the house shorter? We're going to make the house shorter by a Okay. Okay. Yeah. We're going to make the house shorter by a yeah. foot in order to eliminate okay, so that, that one degree like this, no, slash like eight three quarter inch projection into the review. This is just something that uh, we thought of ahead of the hearing just because we knew that Patrick would be concerned about the impact to the review. And this would be a way to uh, essentially negate that imposition. You see what I mean? Are you, I mean, you mentioned that um, what the Blosses didn't, did, did not object, but actually, in fact, they did. Yeah, I'm, I thought I, maybe we got uh, wrong information. I, we talked to Michael, uh, I got the impression that they didn't object. Now, did they submit another? Yeah, they did. Letter? They okay. submitted a letter saying they objected, and yeah. you cited all the neighbors who were who approved it. But we don't have anything from them except from the Post White and Summers, the the couple, and I don't even know where they live. That's in the butcher. Butcher. Oh, no, butcher. The butcher. So they, okay, that's yeah. the butcher. Yeah. And my well, sure, because they didn't. Perhaps. Well, when they <coughs> appealed this to the city council, I I understood. Uh, Yeah, they had submitted. They had submitted one earlier, uh, like you said. That was back in, um, is it April? Uh, that sounds about right. Yeah, there's one that we have. One April first. Um, that was forward from March fifteenth. Uh, that uh, exactly what you just said. With those revised plans, we approved the request for reduction of the north. Side so set back from five to four with a flat appearance and no 18 inch bump out. However, we are still opposed to the rear yard setbacks from 15 to nine, uh, which I don't. Uh, there is no rear yard setback being asked for. These lots are just a little over 2,000 square feet as is. This would leave very little space around the homes to navigate. And then, and then on June 18th, they submitted a second letter saying. They did not want to see this happen. Yeah. Okay. I, believe me, I, I stand corrected. And I know, that's and you have right. more information than I do. I just want It's not it. your fault. I'm just no. saying that, you know, no. I just wanted to clarify the record. I appreciate it. And so the current, the people in the butcher house are the only ones who submitted a letter in favor. Okay. Okay. Okay, that, you you're welcome. Okay, now we will close the public hearing and move to consideration. Jeff, can you come back to this parking thing out front? So, yep. um, are we ratifying a setback to that? It, that's being proposed tonight. That's what's proposed, noticed, and that and the application that uh, they're asking for setback reductions from five to four on the side yards, and a setback reduction from fifteen to um, nine point nine feet seven on the um, uh, front yard. What would happen if that or both were denied? But in a previous. In the, in the previous session, a parking spot was approved. Well, they have a variance, like you said, to reduce it down on this property from two parking spots for the residential uh, use to one. So as uh, the other commissioners have argued that they could place that anywhere within that uh, building envelope. Uh, so they have the right to a parking spot, but there is no setback, potentially, if The setback they're seeking was not part of the decision 
first time this came before. I was just trying to make sure there was no legal <coughs> interpretation that could say, well, thereby, you know, because... Would that stand if we denied fun and site setbacks with the approval for the variance for one car? Yeah. That would stand. Yeah. yeah. They still have they still have the right to have one car instead of two. But not in that space. And, but that space would have to be 15 feet. How, however, unless they get the setback reduction to reduce it. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And you know it's it's currently being used as that. Uh, I think that that's what uh, also needs to be clarified. Uh, but that is being used, that's their one parking space that they're using now for the existing structure. Okay, thank you. Well, well some of you know, um, this is a perfect illustration of why I think that we ought not to establish precedents undermine the building code of the city. And I frankly think that the letter that was read in opposition to this uh, proposal was exceedingly well done. Uh, and it speaks exactly to the reason why I think we ought to be very resistant to uh, accepting uh, changes to the code and then having to come back at us as precedent for yet one more someplace else. Um, and we've several times talked about this and I've been thinking, well, it's not a precedent. Every, every case is, you know, a case on its own, not our job is to decide that. Uh, and it's, it's clearly not uh, accepted as the coin of the land of Cannon Beach when we, when we hear about uh, something that happened in the past being precedent, just a precedent. I mean, on, on the vote before, I actually was against both, and uh, I don't see that there's any new evidence that brings this up to conformity. Um, I, don't, I don't see that it's changed my mind any differently than how I voted the first time, which is having the five-foot setbacks on either side. What the, I don't, the butchers to me is not what precedent means. I don't know what that whole thing looked like. There's a lot of details in it. There must have been, there might have been completely other reasons that we don't know about. I, I don't think we can, if you're taking it on a case-by-case -case basis, that's not a precedent anyway, because we don't know why they were granted that. There may have been some other reason for it. I don't know. Maybe they did promise to keep the old house and we were sort of, or, or the council, whoever was on it at the time was kind of you know, uh, seduced into thinking it was a great idea because they were going to keep the old cabin and then they, it turned out they knocked the whole thing down. This is an oceanfront lot. That is so fortunate, having an oceanfront lot. That's incredible. And it is smaller, but this isn't, there's no hardship here. This isn't, this isn't, again, it's not a compelling reason to grant a setback reduction. If you live on the ocean, if you're lucky enough, chances are you might have a smaller lot, so then you, your creative architect figures out how to make it work for you. They're going up two stories. That's a huge change from what's there now. That's big. There's nothing, nothing anyone can do about that, the neighbors or anyone else. They're legally entitled to do that. But it seems to me, I feel like it's almost like you give somebody an arm and they want a leg. You know, we, they came before us, they presented a reason why they really needed to have one, one parking space instead of two because of the small size of the lot. They didn't mention anything about, you know, wanting side yard setbacks. And then all of a sudden, here we are. Or they did mention it, we said no. But I'm just, they, it, it's sort of like they got this and now they want more. And I just think that's, 
just a, a terrible way for us to do business is, is to grant this. I, I'm very much against it for those reasons. And we have two letters, and both one of them is very compelling. The second one was the pullback letter. I don't know everything that was involved in their thinking, but you know, all the all the neighbors agreeing. I don't see any any evidence of that at all. It's not here in the record before us. And the real estate things. Oh, I talked to two real estate agents. What? So I mean, anybody can say that. You know. It, did they go into the houses? Did they look at them? Did they, you know, did they see what the views were from different rooms? No. They're just, you know, based on what I, you know, it's it's hearsay and it isn't it isn't evidence for us. Lisa, I would have to agree with you. And secondly, I'm very disturbed that they would come and get one parking space for that lot agreed upon and then come back with this plan for huge house that would require potentially will need more than one parking space. Yeah, that, that point I hadn't even thought about, you know, actually, but that was a very good point yeah. that the opponent made. How are they going to have, where are those people going to park? Well, and what's there right now is just a tiny little mm -hmm. cubby hole to put your car in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like Joe said, it's, yes. it's a small lot designed for a small cottage. And that's what was there. Yes. Yeah. And that's, you know, and I'm sorry if people want to put a mansion on, or a large house on a tiny lot. I, it's hard to have a lot of sympathy for that. Well, I think it's time for somebody to make a motion. Well, I move that we deny all three setbacks. The side yard setback and, and the um, front yard setback. Is there a second? I second. second. Further discussion? Okay, roll call. Commissioner Burns? Yes. Commissioner Bennett? Yes. Commissioner Kerr? Yes. Commissioner Knox? Yes. Commissioner Newton? Yes. Commissioner Patrick? Yes. Chair Johnson? Yes. Okay, can I get a motion for the chair to sign the appropriate orders? Second. 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 Roll call. Commissioner Bennett? Yes. Commissioner Kerr? Yes. Commissioner Knox? Yes. Commissioner Newton? Yes. Commissioner Patrick? Yes. Commissioner Burns? Yes. Commissioner yes. Okay. We're going to move on to our work session. And the work session is not open to public comment. You said you're gonna go get some wine, and I thought, what a great well, idea! <laughs> all in wow, favor. you guys are really lax here. Yeah, Your work sessions right. are a lot more fun. Nothing in the nothing in the code against it. <laughs> Can I get a very good way? No, you're good. So, um, my name is Carrie Richter, and I'm a land use attorney who works with Bill Kavisman at Bateman Sidell. And Bill and I are a sort of team that he does, he does municipal law and land use, and I do pretty much nothing but land use. And so when it comes to sort of training um, sessions, I ride the circuit of all the cities we work with and try to do every year a 45-minute chuck and jive about um, land use procedures. 
uh, in the hopes that we can have a dialogue about things that you think about when you're reviewing applications, deciding on applications. I don't want to talk about any applications um, that are before you right now. I don't want to talk about the one we just considered. I want to talk about um, uh, procedures in the abstract and um, just sort of give you what I think are the high points of important land use procedures. I know some of you have been around the block a lot, so this will be pretty redundant, but um, maybe you'll um, have some in, something to take away. Um, I encourage you all to ask questions as we move through. Uh, I'll try to keep it quick and um, get you guys out of here before it gets dark. So, um, as you know, there are um, land use regulations, the world of land use regulations that we operate within are multifaceted, right? We have the Cannon Beach Municipal Code, right? That sets forth the land use regulations that have to be satisfied. The Cannon Beach Municipal Code is impl implements the Cannon Beach Comprehensive Plan. And the Cannon Beach Comprehensive Plan is the city's long-range plan for how it sees growth in the city. And that is the Comprehensive Plan, the principles that are set forth in the Comprehensive Plan are established by um, parameters in state law that are established by a state agency, the Department of Land Conservation and Development, um, that works with a, the Land Conservation and Development Commission to promulgate goals. There are 19 statewide land use goals, and every local government has an obligation under state law to implement those goals by adopting a comprehensive plan that is consistent with them. Those goals are idealistic and broad by definition, and so that allows local governments to use some flexibility in deciding how to balance those goals. They conflict. Um, those goals are set forth in the Oregon Administrative Rules, um, and the obligations to plan are set forth in the Oregon Revised Statutes, those are the state laws, um, that then, you know, then the sort of bigger umbrella from there are the Oregon State and the United States Constitution. So that is the world of land use regulations that we have an obligation to implement in the city. We do that through by changing the slide, but we can't. Maybe I need to. Okay, I can. Um, so we do that through a couple of different types of procedures, uh, different types of review that apply depending on what kind of decision is being um, reviewed. decisions are limited discretion. 
discretion uh, decision making. Um, those are typically uh, land division decisions. Um, and in those kinds of decisions, there's a notice to the neighbors. The neighbors can submit written comments. The director makes the decision. And if uh, somebody's unhappy with the director's decision, they can appeal that to the planning commission. And then it becomes essentially like a type three review, just like uh, an application uh, for a conditional use permit. So, so we will do tonight. Would that be, would that be a two or three? That was a three. That was a three. But I guess I'm not yeah. They, w they wouldn't, yeah, yeah, so that's a good point now. Uh, and that's why often with those, like we have, the tree removals are our perfect example for what we do locally that way. Uh, but often what they'll do uh, in other places I work, they'll have pretty definite, like signage is often a, uh, s some of these in many jurisdictions, where you have pretty strict standards on what, what I can do as an administrator. And if it doesn't meet that, then you know, then you don't, it's just not as usually as contagious, uh, contentious as uh, something like this. There, there are only two types of decisions that can be these type two decisions where you don't have this broader review. Those two types under state law are land divisions and design review. And local governments can decide whether they want that design review piece to be type two. And I don't know in Kansas Beach if they are. I suspect they are not. Yeah. Of, of land use decision that falls under that type 2 category is land division, so subdivision. And are these all, are they, are they published somewhere online? No. All the type 1 and type 2? No. No. Because the county does. What? The county publishes them online. On type 1 and type 2? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. different local governments do it differently, but the point is if there's not a lot of discretion, in other words, if the standard is that the height of the building is 35 feet, there's no need to publish it because there's not going to be any dispute. Because 35 feet is 35 feet. It's not a discretionary determination. That's why the law allows for more limited notice in these non-discretionary decisions. Except the neighbors watch. And they, it, it, 
Yeah, and some some jurisdictions will go above and beyond on notice and things like that, and you can do that, and, and that's that's a good point. I mean, I've worked in plenty of places that do a lot more notice uh, than is required. So the type 3 notice category is the bread and butter of what you all see, and these are variances, conditional use permits, um, Chair, just cut somebody off if they're off track. Yes. All right. 
Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> need a bigger um, gavel. In fact, I, you know, from, from my perspective, I try to encourage not cutting people off, but just educating them. Yeah. I mean, your job is to educate the community about how to give effective testimony. And the better you educate, the more sophisticated your public will be in the future. Um, and I think it's hard because people think this is a really good use. This is a soccer field, and the children need this soccer field. So they parade a hundred children through here and say, "You don't need children, do you?" But it's not about the children ever. It's not about that. It's about specific criteria that relate to a particular use that usually has nothing to do with children. But nobody has the heart to say that, which I completely understand. But that's the kind of thing that we're talking about, we're talking about keeping the testimony directed to the criteria. Um, uh, all of the, so because this is a quasi-judicial hearing, uh, quasi-judicial hearings are said all of the testimony has to be received in this room in the public hearing. And um, that testimony then becomes what's called a record, and the record is all the written testimony plus all the oral testimony. And that record is what gets appealed to Luba. If somebody is unhappy with the city's decision, um, Luba's review is limited to the record. So everybody's shot at submitting evidence is right now at your level. So it's important that you tell people that they have to raise issues uh, at this level because if they don't, they won't be able to appeal them before Luba. Um, the Fifth one has to do with raising constitutional issues. Um, that has to do with bringing a takings plan, just, just in case anybody was interested. If you wanted to bring a takings plan in circuit court against the city, they have to, somebody has to have raised it here. Um, and then the right to impartial tribunal. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so the way these, th these quasi-judicial proceeding um, matters start is with the filing of an application, which everybody knows, and everybody else knows that the applicant bears the burden of showing that the applicable approval criteria are satisfied. That's why we give the applicant the last word. That's why they get rebuttal. It's because they have to bear the burden. They have to show that the criteria are satisfied. If they can't show the criteria are satisfied, then it gets denied, or you apply conditions to make sure it can be satisfied. Um, the application is generally the applicant's first effort to evidence that the, <coughs> that the criteria is satisfied. And, and I want to bring that up in just this, this one we're talking about with the variance versus the setback, front yard setback. I went back and reviewed their initial application. It was not in the initial application. And that's why, you know, when I looked at that variance, it, you know, it, we, we had sat and discussed that two or three times, right? and uh, the project with the architect. And uh, neither one of us considered that because that was just the existing parking space and that's all they were asking for. So we didn't even think about the setback reduction front and the front yard because they're asking for the variance, right? And that's my fault, I should have caught that. But, you know, we went all the way until that's what we were discussing out the door, that, you know, I, David, I went and checked the application. You did not apply for front yard setback variance. I should have caught it, sure, but it's it's your duty to to apply for it, and so it that's what it boils down to. And you know, uh, Bill was at the previous. He he reviewed the thing. He didn't catch it. I didn't catch it. So that's that's what how that. And so that's why this is important. What's in the record is important, and so that's why you know I wanted to clarify that in tonight's. Uh, Discussion. So, from the application, um, the staff drafts a staff report, and that is, so the city staff reviews the application and takes a shot at whether or not the criteria are satisfied, and, but that is nothing more than a recommendation. Uh, the city uh, planning commission and design review board is free to interpret the criteria differently. Um, 
they feel a staff report would be most helpful? Because I, you know, I think that the staff is trained to evaluate and identify the criteria and sort of, <coughs> and, and sort of start a discussion. And my personal opinion, when there is no recommendation, um, decision makers tend to have a hard time knowing where to start. Um, and so that's, you know, but it's a policy. So you, you said that this exists someplace? I believe it does. I think it says that the staff report, staff will create, will, will complete a report and um, provide a recommendation, but I could be wrong. I can look it up. Um, in the meantime, though, I'm going to move on in the interest of time, and I will look it up and come back to it. Um, so. In quasi-judicial proceedings, you have a right to an impartial tribunal. And that means that the decision has to be based on the testimony and evidence that is part of the record. Um, this means you have to disclose ex parte contacts. Uh, for those of you who don't know, ex parte contacts are communications that occur outside of the public hearing. So somebody comes up to me in the grocery store and says, hey, what do you think about this application? Or I want to tell you what a terrible idea it is for you to approve this particular use on this property. Those are ex parte contacts that um, are facts that are obtained outside the record. Um, they can come from actual uh, oral communication. They can come from chat groups on the internet. They can come from newspaper articles. They can come from uh, site visits, if you are to formulate an opinion uh, about something uh, based on a site visit, uh, they can come from attending neighborhood meetings. Uh, those are all examples of ex parte contacts. Uh, you are not prohibited from having ex parte contacts. Rather, your obligation is to disclose them. So the law acknowledges that you live in a community and people know that you're on the planning commission and people are going to speak their mind freely about their thoughts about particular proposals and you are not supposed to be a hermit or a monk who doesn't go out in the community and talk to people. But when you do go and talk to people, you have an obligation to put those contacts into the record so that the public is aware <coughs> of what, um, what additional facts uh, may may be influencing your decision. Um, decisions have to be free of actual bias. Um, actual bias is a predisposition rendering it impossible to make a decision based on the evidence and argument presented. Um, just so you know, establishing a claim of actual bias is a very high hurdle. Um, because it is assumed that everyone has lots of opinions about appropriate development. Uh, I was joking with Jeff earlier that particularly in Oregon, you know, how your feelings about land use is like a contact sport. Like nobody's on the fence about land use in Oregon. People have very strong opinions about, um, about what is and isn't appropriate. Um, and, but those sort of proclivities or feelings about growth um, can't influence your decisions. Um, and if you feel that they will influence your decision, then you need to reach out to Bill and I and we'll talk about whether or not those predispositions rise to the level of being biased and whether or not it would be appropriate for you not to participate in the decision. Um, Decisions have to be free of conflicts of interest. Um, this has to do with pecuniary benefits. And again, this is one of those things that you either have it or you don't. So um, if there's a pecuniary interest that could be affected by a particular application, you want to reach out to Bill and I and we'll help you work through that. Um, potential conflicts of interest are ones that you can announce and uh, determine whether or not to participate. Actual conflicts of interest, you actually have to do step down and not participate. Um, I'm sorry, who, yeah. dis who decides what a potential is an actual? Is that you and Bill? Mm -hmm. okay. I'm, I, that's actually not true. Actually, the, the public process decides. The people who come will decide because they will challenge you. But we help advise you getting to that point. 
So we're sitting here, I say, hey, I talked to someone, but I don't think it biases me. Someone in the audience says, I think it does bias you. Where do we go? Um, well, I would ask you whether or not you could make a decision based on the evidence in this room and the applicable approval criteria. And if your answer was yes, then you would stay on and make a decision. If your answer was no, I would ask you to step down. Who makes that decision? The, 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 person who is, who, the person who is the decision maker makes that decision. I thought that, whether or not they can make they can For instance, in this, in this uh, commission, if there was a, somebody who thought they had a conflict of interest, the commission would decide whether that really was a conflict of interest would not. Well, conflict of interest is different than bias. Conflict of interest is whether you have a pecuniary interest in the outcome of a decision. Okay. You see what I mean? You're going to make money one way or the other. You have an interest in the land that's in it. Okay, okay. Okay, so that... that, that so if somebody claims to have a bias... Okay. Somebody... What so, gives you the authority to decide whether it's a bias or not? I, I, I won't decide. I won't decide. Who will, the way this happens... Who will decide? joking. Um, We've had standing room. Only. The chair, usually the chair decides whether or not it's going to be appropriate to impose time limits, but it ought to be done in my feeling with sort of consultation with the, with the board. You know, it's about, again, balancing the efficiency of running a timely meeting and hearing the public testimony. Um, okay. There is no, there is no rule about what those timelines have to be other than they need to be fair. So if you're going to give the applicant 15 minutes, you need to give the opponents 15 minutes. If you're going to give one opponent three minutes, you need to give all the opponents three minutes. Um, so it just needs to be evenly um, allocated across the board. So yeah, I mean, I've, 
I've limited to three minutes in the past and five minutes in the, in the past. But um, you, you would have to make that decision at the start of the meeting or before the public hearing. You can't impose that once it's started. No, but you, you, you are correct about that. But you can apply um, uh, hearing limits between hearings. So like if you had a variance matter and a conditional use permit matter, yes. you could have no limits on the first one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then this slide is the last slide. And this one's really the most important, I think. And this has to do with what your job is as part of the deliberation and the decision. So this is after you've taken testimony. And um, this is where, you know, sort of the public applicant, the staff's job ends and your job begins. And your job is to determine whether the standards are met. And there's sort of three baskets of ways you can determine if the standards are met. First, you have to interpret the applicable criteria. That means that ambiguities in the text of the criteria have to be interpreted. And, you know, words like significant, words like words like appropriate, those kinds of words are all discretionary words that have to be interpreted. And so you need to interpret the standards and determine uh, uh, what the plain meaning of those terms are. Um, courts have talked about using the context, uh, the purpose or policy of the provision as providing important instruction about what the meaning of ambiguous standards should, should be. Like may. Um, yeah. To me, that's not ambiguous, but it was at the last meeting. Well, I think it depends on the context that the terms may and shall are used. And it depends on if there's uniformity in the code between may and shall. Does the code define the term may as permissive and shall as required? Um, but so, other courts have, have made that decision already. Um, I would, just out of curiosity, sorry, this is Oh, I just said I can't think of an example of that. Why, just out of, out of curiosity, why would you not use a word like required instead of a, a more directed word? Uh, when I write code today, I always use the word required. I never use the word shall and may because of the exact reason that you're talking about. So it's just re weak writing, or, or was there a... In, 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 old, in the old way of writing code, it was all shall. There's word, nothing I behind think, that in terms of. Shall, I, don't think, I don't think we use the word shall the same, it, with the same frequency that you did when you were writing codes 20 years ago. Okay. Or using the English language. Right. <laughs> so um, after you've interpreted the applicable criteria, then we have an ob obligation to explain how the facts satisfy the criteria or don't satisfy the criteria. So we have to make findings. And findings have to explain why and should not amount to mere conclusions. And this is another thing that I think is a staff report is really critical for, is taking an initial stab at the required analysis and then uh, you know, hearing your deliberation and then helping you craft findings. Um, because one of the biggest defects we find in um, decision making now is that is the findings, the analysis. What what gets you? What what about the evidence sifting led you to believe that the criteria were satisfied? The findings have to address all of the applicable criteria, um, and then if the criteria is not applicable. 
but i would like to say that you know i have experienced over my years in many jurisdictions a huge range in this and i can tell you you need to reference findings as much as you I, all of you all is what i'm saying not me you all if you're talking about something and and you have great points uh you know what what if you the more you can say you know to this standard right here jeff 1784 whatever i don't see where it complies with this or you reference that in in how you're doing this that helps us build the, the those findings because we're presenting a record and that's what we're trying to do is capture the record of what you guys are discussing so you'll see me jotting notes as uh, as she does the minutes but I don't have time to wait for the minutes so I have to I have to pretty much go by my notes to get those findings done in the time that's required for me to get those out so I need you all to fill in as much as you can you can't do more than I expect or want I can tell you that and so uh, that helps and you know and you know some jurisdictions will put uh, the you know both uh, the pros and the cons into those findings so that there is part of that record but you know I will try to capture the best I can the discussions but when you go through those points I've been in jurisdictions where they go point by point down through the standards uh, and and that's great for us so just wanted to give you my two cents on those so do you want all of our meetings to run four hours <laughs> no i don't think it has to i mean i, I really think most I'm of what you kidding. talked about really were two main phrases two clauses so yeah. i'd like to I, I want to put a little asterisk on that point around this and not not tonight's discussion for variance but i want to come back to lisa you hit on it we were in this last week and i'm getting the, the idea that we're going to be talking about variance this morning we have findings there's a clear code yet we are going to be faced with requests for variance so if I come and say, here's the standard, it's five feet, now we go into a discussion that isn't the standard anymore. Well, so I that's wanna, why I you have that gap between. But that's the, why you the have the variance, uh, those why you have variance standards, right? Criteria. So yeah, your criteria. You have five that you, if they do this, it says, you know, you if they comply with these, then you should be able to grant a variance. So in other words, if you really want no variance uh, you, you know you don't want to do from this uh, from code of what you've already agreed to at the legislative area then you know you're just going to go a lot of jurisdictions will just have for a hardship variance and that's it and it's pretty much you got it yeah, if you don't want to grant variances you eliminate the variance authority, authority in the yeah code yeah and say all buildings shall be set back five feet and yeah you and, don't have any variance criteria in your code. Right. We right now have five variance criteria in your code, and presumably if an applicant meets those five, they get the variance. That's what takes the he said, she said out of the calculus. You know, the it's my opinion versus, you know, is it good or is it bad? You're supposed to use those criteria if you're measuring blocks, and it's if an applicant satisfies those criteria, they get it approved. If they don't, they don't. And, you know, if you want to change what the criteria are, you can do that. So this that, body can do that. This body can do yeah. that with the, rec well, with the recommendation to the city council. Okay. City council can do it, but you guys we can, can make initiate the recommendation. it. Okay. You can initiate it, and you float it up and see what happens. Um, but there is nothing in state law that says you have to grant variances. And by our code, they can do it the public they can they can request request to amend the ordinance uh, so Got it. didn't mean to derail us yeah, just no, wanted, that, that's trying great. to bridge this theme that we're i don't think most consistent. people understand that i think that's a great point um so then there needs to be evidence right the, the decision has to be based on evidence and so you have to have the evidence in the record to support the decisions um and that's important because sometimes I've heard decision makers, they get to the deliberation phase and they say, well, you know, I was a minor for a really long time. And I can tell you that the dust from this use is going to be tremendous. So I can't approve it for that reason. That's not based on evidence in the record. That's based on evidence that was in that decision maker's mind that they brought up after the record was closed and makes city attorneys go crazy. 
feelings about the place we moved here 30 years ago and blah, 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 which is what we usually get. She actually addressed the place very well. Conditions of approval are things that allow um, you to approve an application um, with assurances that things will be done. Um, and oftentimes staff recommends conditions of approval to sort of ensure the long-term uh, compliance of an application. Uh, but you are certainly free to uh, propose conditions of approval as well. Um, and that's another way to sort of help, help applicants get to approval um, and uh, make sure our code is satisfied. Not always. So um, that sort of sums up my presentation. I'll look up that standard, but are there any other questions? Well, I'm, I'm first of all really grateful you did this. I, I've been, yeah. we've had a lot of questions out of some of these meetings about you know, what the standard practice and more training, so I'm glad you set this up. Thank you. Um, can I come back to the variance for just a second? What's this? What are you seeing with other jurisdictions and how they handle variances? Are there a number of hard lines where they're just, hey, this is the code, you are out. If you don't comply, don't don't even think about it. Or are the the five criteria we have is that pretty standard? Should we revisit this? Um, well, you know, I mean, this is this is one of those things that. Light kind of gets back to scale, though, too, doesn't this? I mean, that's one of the other concerns. If you're going to interpret the criteria to mean that. Well, how, I mean, yeah. They're in light, though, and that there is a building that I'm thinking of right now where they built it somehow with zero setback, and the whole side of the building is moldy because there's no air and light there. So it does, I mean, I think it is a legitimate criteria. I think it can. modified, it's your decision. 
The city, yeah. the city, all cities have what we call prosecutorial discretion. So they can decide whether or not they um, want to prioritize an enforcement. Most local governments don't have the money to enforce every single land use violation because they have to prioritize the ones that are safety concerns. Um, and so that's why that's what they do. I don't know. I don't know about any particular specific in Cannon Beach, but. Well, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure Kerry can answer this, that no, someone could sue the city. Okay, we're going to enforce. Yeah, yeah. This is America. Kerry, <laughs> <laughs> may we have copies of those slides? Is there any way we could have those emailed to us? Yeah, I have them. So you do have those? It would be great to have those yeah. to Thank come you. back to Thank you. Question. If we have a quasi judicial hearing mm -hmm. and it's carried over mm -hmm. for another month or several months, at each one of those meetings, do they have to ask if anyone on the Planning Commission has a conflict of interest? They have to, and the, and the technical way they should ask that is have there been any conflict of interest, bias, or ex parte contact okay. since the last hearing? Okay. Because we're building on it, yeah. right? So I mean, it could be that you, your husband gets a job at the applicant's factory in the time between the, when the right. continuance happens. So you have a conflict of interest at the second hearing that you didn't have at the first. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> you, we would, I mean, I would just go through the procedure that's already there, which. Yeah, which is catch all. Catch all, yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Gary. Thank you. Yep. That's very <laughs> <laughs> or quasi judges. <laughs> We're the judge. Okay. I like that term judge. I'm going to be using that a bunch. Um. All right. We're going to move on to the bed and breakfast part of the agenda. Okay. Yeah, I was asked uh, at, was it the last meeting, I think? Mm -hmm. I was asked to. Um, are directed to bring back some uh, changes or scenarios for bed and breakfast. And so I wanted to first frame, you know, how many bed and breakfasts we currently have or have been approved that we could find. And I'll be the first to say that I'll be so glad when our archives are OCR'd and uh, digital <laughs> and searchable by all of us. That is my goal for this coming year. Um, and, and so we have... Uh, quite a few boxes of land use actions that are still in process or are up in archival uh, format. And so we've done our best to uncover what we could in the record. Uh, but if you go back, how we've done it is just handwritten into this, uh, something like this, a binder type thing. And it will say, uh, like, SR1803, and then it will just say the name. It won't tell you what it was or whatever, so you have to track back and find all of these different acts going back through boxes that are kept upstairs in the attic. So I, that with those, uh, you know, with that preface, this is what I've turned up. And so if you look at it, we have four 
uh, that are approved and currently operating as bread and breakfast in uh, the city, and those are the ones bolded. Then the bolded and italicized ones, that's three of those that are approved and no longer operating as bed and breakfast. And then we have one that's approved and revoked. And then we have one approved and currently op operating as a short-term rental. Uh, so when we look at the number of units approved in Cannon Beach, we have nine total, 16 available bedrooms, of which eight are currently licensed and available as B&B &B units, and one uh, as a STR, a short-term rental. Uh, that's less than 2% of the total bedrooms for rent in the city under the short-term rental licenses, uh, and just 4% of unlimited, because uh, I think that is one of our, the big concerns when we talk about bed and breakfast is this unlimited uh, ability. So uh, the next section, so then I talk about what's our current language. And so it's currently defined as owner-occupied dwelling where no more than two rooms are available transient lodging. Now, one of the concerns that came up in that last one was that, okay, if they have three or four bedrooms, you know, then what are they doing with those other rooms? That's not what this was written for. And, you know, when we go back to the Shells and Mays, this goes back to the Shells and Mays days and also go back to the idea that, okay, somebody could have five bedrooms in their house, but they can only use two of those rooms for um, live current guests, okay? That's what uh, the way this was structured, I think, back when it was done. So... Those are currently, bed and breakfasts are allowed in our R3, our R2, uh, RM zones, and you can see uh, that in the um, RM zone, they are permitted uh, outright use. The others, they're conditional uses, okay? And then... They, each one of those districts will refer you to Chapter 1774, which is that bed and breakfast establishments, which I've copied onto page 4 and 5. And the key points in that are the two-bedroom limit, that the dwelling unit must be owner-occupied. Uh, you have to have one street parking space for each bed and breakfast bedroom uh, and shall be limited to one uh, sign, non-illuminated wall sign, and have a business license. Uh, so when you look at bed and breakfast ordinances around the country and in other areas, th those key points are um, often covered in theirs as well. Uh, and, you know, honestly, most go up to 10 bedrooms or more. Or, I mean, or at least, 10, you know, in the, at least five and usually up to 10, Okay. And so ours at two is very small for a bed and breakfast limitation. Uh, as far as the rest of them, you know, other jurisdictions allow a little bit more uh, signage, but that one parking space per one guest room is a pretty standard kind of model. Um, and then there's, there's others that range in what they require. And I've given you in, at the end of this document Park City's example as kind of a current, fairly recently approved one, and kind of a current language one. So, uh, is this uh, the 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 uh, short-term rental license is required for bed and breakfast established after January first, twenty twenty? Wait a second. That, so, where where are you? You're under under seventeen seventy four. The last the last line there that you highlighted. A city bit. Oh, what page are you on, Daryl? It is in a page number. Yeah. Ten. Yeah, see, so, okay, so you're, you're, you're way ahead of us right now, okay? I'm on page five, okay? You're way behind. Well, no, no. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I am. I, good point, Joe. <laughs> well, no, but I just want to know yeah, that that's something you Well, wait, the, yeah, I want to get there, okay? Uh, so, so I propose five scenarios, okay? And because I want to give you a range of different options here. There's different ways of... Uh, what is it? Uh, you know, what's the phrase? Different ways of uh, guy. There you go, skin in the cat. I love the skin in the cat. One. Okay. Number one. Number one that I propose is remove the ability for any new bed and breakfast in Cannon Beach. So, you know, I've given you on number one, which is page six there, 
that shows you that in map everything in black is areas that it's currently allowed to have bed and breakfast in okay so those are all those different districts i told you about r2 r3 and rm okay but if we were to add a line that says bed and breakfasts were permitted prior to january 1st 2025 when by ordinance and i propose we put an ordinance in new bed and breakfasts are no longer permitted we could phase out bed and breakfast okay uh, and all of this would go before a carry and bill before we did any of this this is just my ideas of different ways to skin that cat okay and so then we would you know we would permit the ones that are currently operating uh, but we would s slowly phase out now the other option which uh, I talk about is kind of a, uh, a even stricter standard than that is to strike all bed and breakfast language that's currently in the ordinance and just utilize non-conforming language from now on okay so in other words we're to grant no new bed and breakfasts but even those that are currently bed and breakfasts they will be slowly phased out under that non-conformity language if they want to change structure size or do anything with those structures you know what i'm saying does that make sense if to you? there was an ownership change okay so that's that. coming up i think okay. okay number two is limit the number of new bed and breakfasts by number or by intensity by forcing them to function under the short-term rental ordinance so currently i think one of the complaints was is that bed and breakfast is just allowing another unlimited one into the city uh, and so this would just re allow bed and breakfasts in whatever districts you wanted to but we would say that by doing this with this language that i'm introducing is that they would have to come in and get a short-term rental license so that would keep them to twice a month for each one of those rooms okay that makes sense okay the third option is limit by geography and i've just chosen through an overlay or by rm only so i've shown just where if we just limited it to the uh, residential motel it would limit it to those areas shown in black on this uh, thing and so that's another option of doing this okay number four is rewrite the ordinance to one of the scenarios below now I think maybe the simplest and but then I would ask Carrie or Bill about this is that um, Im improve the bed and breakfast language by limiting conditional use so each wherever it's a conditional use that uh, bed and breakfast is an owner occupied dwelling this is on page 13 uh, 4a Can you have this? okay, okay. 4a it says bed and breakfast is an owner occupied dwelling and i've inser inserted granted through a conditional use which does not transfer with ownership and where no more than two rooms are available for transient lodging so what you're saying is is that they get it come in and then get a conditional use but it doesn't run with that property like we have now in other words that next owner will have to come in and get a, a, a new conditional use and I've, I've done this in other areas and I don't know if it's, it's okay in Oregon, but that's, that's how we operated. Um, my preference would be that we just make it good for 10 years mm -hmm. or 20 years rather than by ownership because the city doesn't know when ownership changes hands. Yeah, that's good with me. Okay. So, so, that so put, another, a, put a horizon give on it. Give it a horizon, yeah. a 10 year sunset. Okay. Um, rather than an ownership, because folks don't have to come in and ask the city or notify the city when they change ownership. So. Okay. And so then 4B is another scenario of correcting the language. And I've just changed the definition. And so I've, I've kind of tightened it a little bit, hopefully. A conditional commercial use so it's they've got to have a conditional use which does not transfer with ownership but we could say 10-year horizon or whatever uh, or for a 10-year time period located in an owner or on-site manager occupied dwelling in which up to four bedrooms are rented night or two whatever you want to do I just put four uh, 
nightly or weekly, and where one or more meals are provided to the guest only, the price of which is usually included in the room rate. The suggested menu shall be available to the public by posting on-site and on all social media outlets or websites. Bed and breakfast inns are considered a lodging use which typical, where typical lodging services are provided, such as daily maid service. One off-street parking space is required per guest room, and one non-illuminated wall sign not exceeding one and a half square feet is allowed per lot. So what I tried to do there is kind of take some of what like the Park City and some of the newer ones are doing it, because often we are, and, and I've heard you guys say, well, and I've heard people ask me, uh, well, do they have to serve a breakfast? Well, nowhere in our language does it say they have to serve a breakfast, except for in the name, bed and breakfast. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when they have to advertise that, as other jurisdictions have done, you know, then it's at least posted, and hey, if somebody's going to be expecting a bed and breakfast, and that's what they see on the advertising, then they come and they don't have breakfast, they're going to get some reviews against it. We don't it necessarily, that jurisdiction doesn't have to, often it's more socially uh, enforced, you know, by that. So, so excuse me? A bed and breakfast would have a bed. And a breakfast, hopefully. Yeah. So, uh, which, who knows? Uh, so, uh, then 4C is uh, proposed new oversight stay language, and I've shown you an example uh, back, uh, which is the Park City example. But this is just a scenario where, hey, let's, let's get rid of some of this and, and, and redo the language because I have a lot of grief, as you know, with a lot of our uh, unit type of language, like accessory dwelling, you know, means an attached or detached dwelling unit. Well, what is not attached or detached? Well, I think that you're trying to, you're, what, by using the terms attached and detached, you're trying to say this is the world of dwellings. But can't you if just you say just dwelling said, unit? You could, but then somebody would say, well, you didn't say attached, so you must not have intended to include attached. Hmm. Huh. I mean, I've always heard to limit is, or you know. No, I, yeah. I get what you're saying. You're, you're saying okay. there isn't an alternative, yeah. attached or detached, and I get what you're saying. Yeah. I, I think it could go either way. Well, and um, and for and so like in the next one, for instance, containing two dwelling units with or without a common wall or ceiling. Well, I know an example in town where <laughs> there is a. A building that's not attached to the main home, but there is a walkway. I mean, uh, an elevated wood walkway between the two. So, but it's either attached or detached. It's well, one of the two. Well, do you consider the walkway? It's it's bolted to. No, to, no. I, I, and so the same with with or without me, a common wall. Well, common wall would be a different thing, but in this case, it's attached to both units. It's bolted to both units, uh, to the walls of one house to the other. I, I, yes, and we could argue that point, but it, I don't think that's why I say I don't think that you should have either one of those as a, the term for dwelling unit, because dwelling unit is what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think that the reason why you have those descriptions is because later in your code you have siting standards for attached dwellings and you have siting standards for detached dwellings. And so... That's why, so if you are looking up the definition of attached dwellings, you'd go back to dwelling and you'd see attached or detached would fall under the heading of yeah, dwelling. like a single family attached and detached. Yeah, I, I understand that. But if it's not used within that, I don't believe that that's why, you know, that's what my understanding is. You we don't need it. it. Yeah, you wouldn't need it. Okay. So I have a... Uh, quite a few of those within our dwelling unit languages are like that, like the with or without a wall. Uh, so uh, anyhow, it, we have other areas that we could get into is what I'm trying to say. But I don't know if we need to from what I've heard from you guys so far. But I wanted to bring at least these scenarios to you and and... Jeff, when you say, I don't know if we need to, based on what you've heard from us so far, what do you, what do you mean? Like we, 
Well, all I've heard so far is intensity that the bed and breakfast language right now, you don't, uh, from my understanding earlier is the problem with the, the one that was approved was A, that it runs, you know, the, that the, if they get a bed and breakfast, that it runs continually with the land. And that wasn't really, I think, appreciated. Uh, and then second, that uh, it was unlimited turnover at that unit. So the intensity of that use was not appropriate for where it's being used. So you're kind of asking, why do we need bed and breakfasts or where do we have? Why do we have bed and breakfasts? Well, it's the people that benefits for the people that live here permanently but have extra rooms that they can rent out as opposed to the short-term rental where people come in yeah. away yeah. and come back in. So that's the group, I think, that would want these. But you can find, by example, an Airbnb and rent a room in somebody's house. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that is kind of the, loop, the <laughs> loophole I see here right now. Right. You know, that is what could be permitted. But I, I do want to, you know, that's why I wanted you guys to discuss it because uh, and why one of the scenarios is, you know, just is, is it a magnitude because, you know, I, we haven't seen that many come in, but I do see that there's the potential of that. And that's why I wanted to bring it up because I do see that there, you know, Airbnbs are happening. So do we want those all over? Because this is a form where somebody could come in and utilize that and, uh, you know, not have to get a short-term rental. And we could whittle it down to just kind of the, I guess, start with, do we allow them? When do they expire? And start there. And then if exactly. we, we want to dive into the weeds on common law or not, we can, yeah. don't know that we need to. Yeah, we I'm, and that is that is exactly my, my point and kind of that I felt you guys wanted to kind of have the discussion, but I didn't see where you guys really wanted to get into the whole minutia of a lot of this stuff right, right now. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, is there something that says that that cash needs you know, needs to appear in the process? In other words, with a bed and breakfast or an accessory dwelling, uh, or maybe even in some cases with uh, a residence. Can, has, does the city have any control over just? Letting friends stay at a house or use a room, or you know, does there, has, does there have to be a cash payment of some sort? Or? We, uh, I, I, I know of no place that can force anybody to. Are you saying pay, pay or you know what are you? I am trying well, to understand what you're getting. My point about. is uh, part of the. Part of, I'm not, I'm, I don't buy into the, the concern, I guess, about you know, being overrun by short-term rentals. Um, but it seems to be one of the, you know, the current um, topics of discussion about short-term rentals. <clears throat> they're everywhere. Um, but if they're everywhere, how do they differ in terms of the consequences? Uh, from somebody just, you know, letting their buddies, you know, come down and use the house and, and bug out. Right. Yeah. And, we. And is there any way the city has to deal with it if there's not cash involved? Well, we do deal with it. I mean, we do get. Uh, we have a code enforcement official. If we have some uh, a report or she reports that she sees. Uh, multiple uh, vehicles from different states or, you know, different vehicles, period, uh, using a house continuously. Uh, and we will look into that. We've been doing that it's well, since October, November. look into it, and there's no money exchanged for the people around. They, they still can't do that, yeah, under our, yeah. Um, they can't do that. Yeah. If they have a short term rental permit. Yeah. But if they don't have a short-term rental permit. Oh, yeah, if they don't have a short-term rental permit, I mean, all that we can do is make them abide by, you know, like you said, parking codes and things like that. 
but we will often we will you know ask them you know or we noticed you had quite a few people staying you know are you do you have a business license are you renting the place but that's all we can do i don't know how other people felt about this but the thing that kind of stuck in my craw on that was one it seemed like a uh, an end, and I don't know if either of these were true or the first one anyway, but it seemed like an end run around the, the short term rental policy mm -hmm. to get that open ended. Uh, the bed and breakfast? Yeah. yeah. I don't know that she that was her intention, but it is very likely someone could do that with the way this is written. And the other was we've a number of times talked about affordability, and a property that's a duplex was taken out of the housing inventory. And so for me, as I look at, thought about changing this section, it was to prevent further properties that were intended to be used for um, not short-term rentals yeah. and to make, to prevent someone from, you know, taking a, a loophole, a potential yeah. loophole in the property. In the yeah. code. So I guess to frame the argument would be, A, do you feel that there should be some uh, bed and breakfast or Airbnb type of ability within the city for somebody to do that? Now, you know, you can put limitations on that, like we, I said in my one of my scenarios about they have to get a short-term rental, so you're putting the intensity kind of thing on, but or by geography or uh, overlay. So, you know, or do you want to get rid of bed and breakfast at all, you know, for, for the future? Well, just talking out loud, and I don't have an opinion, but... Um, why would we get rid of bed and breakfast? Um, well, so we have a world with Airbnb where people are renting out their houses. We're trying to regulate that. Um, the only difference between that and bed and breakfast is presumably um, someone's providing. Yeah, breakfast. the breakfast, <laughs> the breakfast option. <laughs> so then it seems like you would want to run the bed and breakfast through the same program or run our short-term rental program. That's yeah, exactly. Is that? I mean, what I'm wondering is the, the the issue that came up a few months ago that we really <coughs> brought this forward. That B and B are they are they paying a room tax to the city? Is there any way? I mean, if they're renting a room and it's I think they do transient room tax. Okay. Yeah, they don't get a short term rental license. Yeah. So they aren't inspected for safety. Yeah, they are. Yeah, yes. we, oh, they are. we okay. inspect okay. that. Okay. Yeah. But they essentially have an unlimited. Right. Yes. Right. They could have right. somebody different every night. Yeah. They don't have filtered water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if we put them on the short-term rental program, the most they could have is five years. No, it's uh, fourteen days. We don't. Is that? Well, that's right. We do, we're not issuing it yeah, for five years. Yeah. That's, that's the that's the on that. so that's the only one. Yeah, and it's just one. Yeah. yeah, that answers the the question on term. Yeah, mm -hmm. certainly. You know, on turnover, that's you know, going to come reapply. That might be a really simple solution to this issue. We have. Option two. Oh yeah, yeah yeah surely, and yeah, email me or call me if you ha if you have. A per, uh, preference, okay? okay you're make this decision, right? No, uh, no. Just kind of give me direction on on the what to bring back for you, okay? okay. Thank you. Is that your notebook? I'll pick, I pick it up. Oh, okay. Sorry. I pick up the paper. So yeah, so uh, you know, I'm happy to just kind of draft up something like that as a point of discussion. Yes. We vote on oh, yeah. Go. No, well, no, 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 <laughs> no, because no. you don't, you're not, I don't think you've got language before it, you to vote on. No, no, no it's a uh, work session. <laughs> He's one to go quasi judicial on everything. <laughs> <laughs> Give him the gavel. <laughs> so, you need a bigger gavel. <laughs> Jeff, uh, earlier you, know, you regaled us with data about rentals were available in town and so forth and how actually how few
few there were, as opposed to the rumors about you know, extensive extension from um, what it was in the past. And has any evidence come out since then about? We're going to be going to council uh, July in July with. Um, We'll update our data to the latest, but no, I, I, we haven't had a massive increase, you know, or We're anything. Still, at still right at 200, you know, and so we haven't seen any growth, even, you know, with maybe threatened language changes and and things like that. So, okay, I, I still keep thinking that we're beating on a that escaped already from the well, I, I think you guys should be commended because you're one of the few, I mean, people come and they ask me, they call me up because we're the only ones that really have the two-week, you know, that kind of intensity limit. And so people call and ask you about it, that all the time, um, you know, because it's nowhere else do they do that. And so, you know, I, I do think that we 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 have taken steps to limit and do what's not not done elsewhere. Well, and, and it does such a good job of cutting into the business of you know, weekend or one night stand kinds of, of rentals. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Okay. Um, so the informational items, um, we have the uh, tree stewardship plan for Cannon Beach. Um, I assume all of you kind of read through that. Seems like it's pretty self explanatory. Um, Jan, did you have anything you wanted to? Yeah, I, I actually just read through it, but not that closely, so I might have some input for you on that, too. Um, okay, ongoing planning items? I did want to respond to uh, the living wall. Um, <laughs> well, I have we pictures should call Lisa back. of the living wall. I know. She just <laughs> left right when I get to the... the she would be filing She would have felt tomorrow. better. Yeah, <laughs> I, exactly. No, she would have probably... She would have stayed. Well, <laughs> this, unfortunately, my picture goes all the way around the wall, but as a cause of the printing, it didn't print off the whole thing. But uh, looking at the conditions that were put on it, um, you know, it seems to comply with the conditions. It's, it's got a watering system. Uh, I did not see, you know, you can look and you can count, and I haven't done a full count, but I do not see that big of a failure rate in the plantings. Now, granted, it could have been more diverse planting and all that, but that wasn't specified, so I don't see where. When, we, did, you, when did you take this? Just place? last week. Oh, yeah. Okay. And but the bottom if looked, row is. If you had looked at it earlier, it wouldn't yeah. be this way. Yeah. So the bottom I, row isn't planted at all? Or well, no, that's, that's because it can't be. See, that's yeah. the, uh, the basis of the, oh. the structure. So that's a structural component. So everything above that, though, is in fine. Now, we'll, we will try to keep monitoring that but I you know I you know if you don't have more specification in your development agreement or whatever I just don't see where you could really ask them for uh, much more you know I looked at this after that last meeting because I hadn't seen it in a long time and my memory might be failing me but this doesn't look like the same wall we were talking about when I drove by this looks did you tell them you were coming to take a picture? <laughs> <laughs> I actually photoshop that. Oh, yeah, right. It, 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 yeah, I see why you say that. It <laughs> kind of looked like, you know, recently transplanted. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it certainly looks that way to me. It might be plastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. okay. I think it's that um, Okay, 
anything else to uh, go to the order? Hi, that's all I have. Yeah. I, I would like to come back to a discussion at some point on this variance issue that we're so uh, not the one tonight, but just our general tenor on this. We've gone. Um, we've had. Uh, I didn't hear the first part of what you said. I, I'd like to at some point come back to the variance discussion. This body, just to kind of set a baseline for how we do these. Um, so that we don't maybe have the same conversation or we're all over the board or get too into too much gray area on it. Um, if you can straighten out the gray area, I'm welcome, <laughs> I'm welcome to hear it. Having only having been, one of these, <laughs> been the junior member here, I realize that this may be something I need to get seasoned. Well, but, yeah. but it just seems like we're coming up with it a lot. You know what I, I might suggest, sorry to interrupt, I might suggest that uh, Jeff pulled together sort of a survey of variance criteria from other jurisdictions that might give you some ideas of things that like work or don't work. I mean, with, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's I mean, fine. you could choose like a couple beach places and maybe and, a yeah. Lake Oswego kind of place Oh yeah. see what kind of other what other jurisdictions are doing and see if there's something that we can you can use. I mean, I'm always for the like, don't invent the wheel if it's already been invented. That's a good idea. I agree. And, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've discussed uh, also, and I know it's not that popular in Oregon, but form-based codes are also, you know, I think a perfect fit for our community. And it's something that I think we need to talk about. And we're going to be going into a discussion with. Uh, we're writing a whole new code. It's a whole other scale. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> we're, but we're going into um, um, visioning comprehensive plan uh, oh, yeah, work. So, time. yeah, it's a perfect time to kind of talk about this. So appreciate that. Yep. Okay. And we're adjourned. Thank you. It's a very helpful presentation. Oh, good.